Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers of this virtual conference for the kind invitation to speak today. I hope everyone listening will gain some new piece of information from this talk, if not several. My name is Dr. Michael Hall, and I'm a gastrointestinal oncologist uh, and clinical cancer genetics expert at Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. At Fox Chase, I'm fortunate to lead a small but mighty department of four MDs, five genetic counselors, two advanced practitioners, and clinical research and support staff. Today, uh, I'll mostly be wearing my GI oncologist hat to talk about what's new in colorectal cancer treatment, a 2021 update. As a reminder of colorectal cancer incidence and mortality in the United States, many people don't realize we have seen real and measurable declines in colorectal cancer incidence uh, and mortality since the 1970s, with a 55% decline in the death rate since 1970. This can almost entirely be attributed to greater awareness and screening for colorectal cancer uh, in this country, primarily performed by colonoscopy. However, interestingly, there's also been a 2% increased incidence in colorectal cancer in the under 50 population since 2012. Um, some data actually even suggests that this started even earlier. Survival from colorectal cancer greatly depends on the stage of diagnosis and non-white patients are still diagnosed later than white patients. A big part of this is attributable to stage at diagnosis. Underserved and Black Americans especially tend to be diagnosed at more advanced stages of colorectal cancer where cure is less likely. Overall, thankfully, well over half of patients will be diagnosed with early and or curable disease, but a remaining 15 to 20% will have metastatic disease at diagnosis. Uh, which makes cure much more difficult and survival much shorter. Around 40% of patients are diagnosed at early stage where the five-year survival is 90%. Um, with locally advanced stage, we know we have about a 70% five-year survival, but when patients are diagnosed with metastatic cancer, cancer there's only about a 14 to 20% five-year survival. And of course, when we drill down to disparities in stage of diagnosis, we quickly find that poorer, underinsured, and less educated patients, as well as Asian, Black, and Latinx patients compared to white patients, uh, but that there is also uh, a geographic component to disparities where living in the South and Central U.S. is associated with screening rates 10 to 15 percent lower than on the coasts. So while we've made a lot of progress in decreasing incidence and mortality from colorectal cancer in the past 40 years, there's still a long way to go. So let's, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about new molecular technologies in the management of colorectal cancer. Circulating tumor DNA, also known as ctDNA, has become a new and exciting modality in the treatment of colorectal cancer. What's exciting about this is that this technology now allows for very small amounts of circulating tumor cell DNA, which is free floating in the blood to be detected uh, and separated from a standard blood sample. And with that sample, we can do many uh, incredibly valuable things in the diagnosis and treatment of colon cancer. We can use the information from this DNA to understand whether a tumor has particular targets that we may want to use for treatment, but without having to put the patient through uh, an invasive biopsy. So this is especially useful for patients who can't have a biopsy. Uh, on the same vein, uh, circulating tumor DNA can also be used uh, uh, to monitor a patient for emergence uh, of resistance mutations to therapy, uh, allowing early progression to be detected earlier and therapies changed uh, and, and uh, most importantly, unneeded side effects to be avoided or minimized. Third, circulating tumor DNA can also help us prognosticate patients who have had a surgical resection, but whom we are unsure whether they would benefit from adjuvant therapy uh, with chemotherapy. Several studies are ongoing nationwide and worldwide looking at the power of circulating tumor DNA to help doctors know whether they should give adjuvant chemotherapy to a patient, particularly uh, a low risk stage three or stage two patient, or, or whether they can forego this. 
Finally, circulating tumor DNA can also be used to detect cancer um, uh, uh, in seemingly healthy individuals. New platforms uh, have shown their ability to detect pre-symptomatic tumors and even distinguish the tumor types in patients where we actually would otherwise have no idea that there was a cancer uh, hiding or brewing. So this could really be revolutionary in reducing the screening burden in the population from things like mammogram and uh, colonoscopy, uh, as well as to aid us in the diagnosis of rare or occult tumors for which we currently don't even screen patients. Finally, we've seen some, some pretty magnificent advancements in recent years following the advent and widespread uptake of next generation DNA sequencing uh, in uh, the hereditary testing for cancer risk, as well as tumor testing. Uh, in the germline setting, NGS has allowed uh, more cost-efficient, rapid, and wide-scale germline testing using panel-based uh, next-generation sequencing technologies, rather than uh, having to test every gene sequentially, was, which was really where we were uh, even up to about five or six years ago. While this approach has increased the comprehensiveness of the testing we're able to offer patients, it's also added complexity to the process of counseling uh, and to the interpretation of results, especially uh, the much larger number of uncertain results that can be found uh, when testing in this way, particularly in, in uh, minority patients who have just generally had less genetic testing done than Caucasian populations. Uh, a large study led by Jules Samiter uh, at the Mayo Clinic, published recently in JAMA Oncology uh, and referenced here in the upper right, found that among all comers with, uh, col with colorectal cancer, there was roughly about a 15% germline mutation uh, rate finding. This correlates closely with uh, results from Sophia Stadler and her colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering who performed matched tumor normal testing, again, using next generation sequencing technologies uh, on tumors and a blood sample. And again, in their colon cancer population found very similar results, about 15 patients with uh, actionable germline findings relevant to perhaps both the patient and their family members. So now let's move from colorectal cancer diagnostics to treatment. One treatment advance I wanted to bring up uh, was the increasing use of minimally invasive surgeries in the management of colon cancer and rectal cancer. While uh, what I show here, which is called TAMIS surgeries, have been around for a while, um, there are increasingly more providers with skills in this arena. These surgeries can be especially useful in patients with superficial lesions in the rectum, where a more extensive rectal surgery is not preferred due to poor health of the patient, or comorbidities, or perhaps due to the proximity of the lesion to the anal sphincter uh, or other uh, structures. One uh, limitation of this approach is that unlike uh, a low anterior resection, which is the uh, standard of care surgery, which would remove part of the rectum and uh, surrounding tissue, including lymph nodes, in a TAMIS surgery, there's no lymph node harvest at the time of surgery uh, because this is a superficial surgery. So ultrasound, uh, and MRI are used to help evaluate uh, lymph nodes in the area. Um, but of course, these are imperfect. So there, there is a, a risk of nodal relapse uh, in patients who undergo this surgery. Many new studies have also come along in the perioperative setting for more advanced rectal cancers. And this has really sort of changed the landscape of how we're treating rectal cancers in the last few years because the, the way we'd been treating them for many years before had, had always really been the same, uh, the, the same way. So for many years, rectal cancer for stage two and three disease was always treated, you know, as I said, the same way. Chemo radiation for five and a half to six weeks, followed by a surgery, followed by adjuvant chemotherapy. But three trials in the last few years have examined different approaches to delivering chemotherapy and chemoradiation. Um, in the RAPIDO trial, which I uh, have here at the left, uh, all chemo and radiation were given before surgery, uh, with radiation given rapidly right at the start, uh, which can be particularly helpful in patients that are quite symptomatic. So this approach is one um, version uh, of an approach that's increasingly called TNT, or total neoadjuvant therapy. Uh, in the uh, OPRA trial, TNT was uh, also used, um, uh, uh, but with a slightly different approach. The goal in the OPRA trial 
it, it actually started in one arm with the chemo radiation followed by chemo, again, all given before surgery. Uh, the second arm was chemotherapy followed by chemo radiation all before surgery. But actually the goal was, was actually not to have surgery for some patients, but to see how many patients in each of these arms were having a complete response to the therapy and could potentially avoid a surgery uh, with data uh, over the past several years showing that patients who have complete responses may be able to avoid surgery. So this, um, you know, this, this was particularly important for patients who have tumors that are very low in the rectum that put the, uh, that put the, uh, the rectum at risk or put the anus at risk, I, I meant to say, uh, uh, and where an approach where we may be able to uh, avoid a surgery may be uh, the approach that, that, that is most attractive. Finally, in the Pradesh study, the dial uh, on neoadjuvant therapy was sort of turned up even higher than it's been in the last few years. So these patients started uh, their, their chemotherapy not with two drugs, but with a three uh, drug regimen um, of fulfirinox, which is a, a, not a regimen that we sort of uh, right now typically use uh, in, in rectal cancer. So the, the goal of this was to, was to give even more chemotherapy upfront to perhaps shrink tumors more and reduce the risk of distal uh, relapse uh, even more with intensive sur uh, chemotherapy upfront. They then underwent surgery after that intensive chemo and then some additional less intensive chemo afterwards. So this was not a TNT approach, but was just, again, uh, an approach meant to, um, meant to uh, provide more intensive chemotherapy uh, immediately to these patients. Another landmark chemotherapy study in the past few years has been this study called IDEA. Uh, here, the study team examined whether in the adjuvant setting after resection of a stage three colorectal cancer, three months of chemotherapy, which was uh, uh, up until recently not considered standard of care, would be equivalent uh, or non-inferior to six months, which has been the standard of care for many years now. So what this investigative team found was that in those patients with low risk stage three colorectal cancers, that being uh, N1 disease of stage three uh, colorectal cancer, um, three months of either Fulpox or Kpox uh, chemotherapy were acceptable uh, and non-inferior to six months. Uh, and actually the Kpox data edged out the Fulpox data as being even a little bit better. Um, but in the high risk setting, three months uh, of full box was clearly inferior to six months of full box, while three months of KPOX was still non inferior to six months. So this kind of really changed the landscape of how we think about uh, the duration of chemotherapy. I, I think a couple of things this trial did. First of all, I think now in patients who are able to tolerate it and are willing, I think there's a sense that KPOX therapy is actually perhaps a little bit better than full box. And certainly uh, in high risk disease, you would not consider uh, that uh, three months of therapy with full box. You would only consider potentially three months of therapy with KPOX. Now it's not 100% clear to me how many docs are actually doing that. Currently in my practice, I use three months uh, of KPOX uh, in, in the low risk setting. And I still give, uh, uh, or generally still give six months of therapy in the high risk setting. But I, I think, uh, again, practice patterns uh, are, are evolving with time. Okay, so now let's wrap up with new approaches to management of advanced disease. So let's flash back again to our discussion of diagnostics. Um, the standard molecular uh, diagnostic evaluation for colon cancer uh, has really changed a lot in recent years and now includes uh, mismatch repair or MSI testing uh, and tumor mutational burden testing to determine eligibility for immunotherapy, uh, RAS and BRAF testing to determine eligibility uh, for uh, anti-EGFR therapy or the Beacon regimen, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, HER2 testing to determine eligibility for anti-HER2 therapy, uh, which uh, again has also uh, uh, come about as a, as a treatment approach uh, in about six to 10% of colorectal cancers. NTRAC fusion testing to determine use of NTRAC inhibitors, which again are, are rare, but maybe 1% 1, 1 of colon cancers may have these NTRAC fusions. Uh, and then, uh, you know, if a clinical trial is being considered, other targets like uh, MET or MET amplification, uh, BRCA1-2, ATM, and other targets uh, are, are assessed on these large uh, next-generation sequencing panels, which I kind of discussed earlier, uh, and are also evaluated. 
several important studies uh, have come along in recent years demonstrating that uh, immunotherapy is highly effective in the treatment of MSI high colorectal cancers and across uh, really any tumor type that's MSI high uh, and all the GI cancers that are MSI high. Um, so for colorectal cancer, about 15% of cancers overall will be MSI high, but these are kind of dominated by uh, earlier stage cancers because only about 5% of metastatic colorectal cancers will be MSI high. Um, recently just reported this past year, the Keynote 177 trial on the left showed that for MSI high colorectal cancer, a substantial number of patients will achieve long-term disease stability and should be receiving uh, immunotherapy upfront. Um, and I think this is really important. Uh, you know, it's not everyone though. Uh, and I think if you look at this at this at this picture uh, uh, in the lower left here, you see that that for a short while chemotherapy actually did better, and, and that's probably for those patients who have very aggressive disease because immunotherapy does take some time to really uh, sort of pick up speed and start controlling tumors. So for very aggressive disease, I, I, I do not argue with, with doctors who still use uh, chemotherapy in that setting, but for, for slower growing or smoldering disease, I think these data uh, clearly show that uh, starting with uh, immunotherapy uh, is, is the best approach. Um, another trial, Checkmate 142, which I show here on the right, also looked at dual agent immunotherapy in the frontline setting. Um, uh, and of course, there's been several trials that have looked at single and dual agent therapy uh, in the later uh, settings or advanced uh, uh, heavily pretreated setting of colorectal cancer now. Um, again, th this, this, uh, this Checkmate 142 trial uh, showed, <laughs> excuse me, perhaps slightly better uh, response rate with dual agent therapy in the frontline setting, but uh, this has not uh, been FDA approved yet. So still frontline setting is uh, single agent uh, therapy for patients who are, have MSI high uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, as I alluded to a moment ago, uh, Scott Kopetz and his team from MD Anderson Cancer Center have really been leaders and working hard to develop multi-agent targeted therapy regimens for BRAF D600E mutated colon cancers, which represent about 5 to 10% of colon cancers overall, and are generally considered by doctors to, to be some of the most aggressively behaving colon cancers. So what this team has been able to show really through some uh, incredible research and, and breakthrough use of, of, of dual or triple agent uh, blockade, uh, they've shown that using an EGFR inhibitor like cetuximab or panitumumab uh, uh, plus a BRAF inhibitor um, can work together to dually block uh, uh, the RAS pathway uh, and, uh, and, and really lead to, to, to doubling of, of, of response rates in these, in these individuals. Um, and, and really, uh, when this, when this uh, study came out, became the, the first regimen to really target uh, this, 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 this generally poor prognosis uh, group of patients uh, and provide newfound benefits that we were not able to see before with single, single with uh, chemotherapy using one of these uh, targeted therapies uh, alone rather than in a doublet. New light's also been shed in the last several years on colorectal cancer that primarily presents as metastatic peritoneal disease. We know these individuals have the poorest prognosis among patients with colon cancer and only probably represent about 10% about or so of, of new uh, metastatic colorectal cancer diagnoses. But there's been lingering questions for years about whether um, cytoreduction, also sometimes called peritoneal stripping, uh, either alone or followed by heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy or HIPEC, which is something that's been used for years uh, in the GYN community for treatment of ovarian cancer. So the question has been, you know, does, could this also be used as a way to control this local abdominal disease uh, in patients with metastatic colon cancer? Um, you know, we've been doing this in the GI world for a while as well for low-grade mucinous tumors of the appendix, but, but really there, there had, had not been a, uh, a move or data to support that this should be used in metastatic colon cancer. But the authors of, of this trial, Prodige 7, set out to, to look at this question. Um, and, and in this study, they, they randomized folks uh, with metastatic colon cancer with peritoneal-only disease to uh, surgical cytoreduction uh, or debulking uh, versus the cytoreduction uh, plus this heated uh, uh, intraperitoneal uh, chemotherapy. <laughs> Excuse me. Interestingly, they found that while 
outcomes and survival uh, after the cytoreduction part of this were really impressive. The, the, the HIPEC itself didn't actually offer a whole lot of additional benefit. Um, so in my view, um, this has actually really opened the door to increased use of cytoreduction in patients who present with um, perhaps especially limited met metastatic peritoneal disease that is amenable to cytoreduction and patients that are healthy enough to undergo a procedure like this with a specialized physician who knows how to do a cytoreduction. But, but the, clearly from, from this trial, the, the patients who were able to do this and have a really uh, good cytoreduction done definitely benefited. Their survival was improved. Whether, whether we'll be able to ever figure out what we need to do to the HIPEC to make it better um, so that there's benefit in that part as well, uh, I think uh, we, we still have to see. Finally, a few words about hepatic arterial infusion pumps or HAI pumps. Um, this approach to treating metastatic liver cancer, uh, 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 metastatic colon cancer to the liver and liver only um, was developed and perfected pretty much in the early 2000s at Memorial Sloan Kettering by Dr. Nancy Kemeny and her colleagues and really still remains an option for patients who have liver-only metastatic disease and are willing to accept um, having one of these uh, you know, pumps uh, implanted in the abdomen and, and, and plugged into their uh, uh, hepatic artery. Um, the, you know, this is pretty specialized technology and really requires sort of expertise in placing these pumps and managing these pumps. But this, this has slowly become uh, more frequently found uh, at different centers across the country. And uh, there's a, a slow uh, uptake of, of, of acceptance of this, of this kind of technology in the right situation. Um, I think that, uh, you know, again, a big part of, of, of this kind of therapy is really selecting patients that uh, are going to benefit from this, uh, who are, are willing to accept, accept some of the additional risks that having one of these um, pumps placed and, and who understand that, that the, the management of, of these pumps is, is technical and nuanced and it really requires um, a high level of expertise. But I, I think the data from Sloan Kettering and the Kemeny Group have demonstrated that uh, remarkable responses and extended survivals can sometimes be achieved uh, in these patients uh, with, the, with the placement of these pumps and the use of FE, FUDR uh, uh, chemotherapy delivered directly to the liver. Finally, a few new uh, areas of research that are under development and that I'm kind of keeping my eye on um, because they're exciting. Uh, one is the uh, uh, EGFR targeted therapy and, and whether we should be delivering it more of an on and off setting rather than a continuous setting. Um, development and testing of vaccines for metastatic colorectal cancer, uh, as well as development of vaccines in, uh, in the colorectal cancer prevention setting for patients with Lynch syndrome. Um, the testing of PARP inhibitors in patients with colon cancer that are deficient uh, in homologous recombination or HRD, like tumors with BRCA mutations, ATM mutations, and CHEP2 mutations, which once you sort of put all those together is actually a, a sizable chunk of colon cancers, maybe about 15%. Um, and finally, the, uh, the efficacy of immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting after resection of, my, of MSI high colon cancer. Um, this is an area that I think is particularly exciting. There's a national trial going on called Atomic, which is evaluating this. I think this is particularly, obviously, uh, really important for Lynch syndrome patients uh, uh, because this could really sort of be a, a game changer for those Lynch syndrome patients who present with, uh, with uh, advanced stage colorectal cancer who uh, are surgically cured by surgery, but who are at risk of recurrence. Uh, so I think, you know, hopefully we'll have uh, lots of people uh, joining up for this trial and we'll get uh, great information from this trial in the coming years as to whether immunotherapy has benefit in the adjuvant setting. And with that, I thank you for your attention.